friends, uh, in the second part of the discussion about Adrian Rich, uh, uh, Professor Palnark Paul will tell us uh, about the important poems uh, that she wrote later and uh, for which you know she is known in, in the American literary scene. And uh, therefore, I, I straight away uh, request uh, Professor Pal Nagpal to, to come and tell us more about the poems that Edith Enrich wrote. So, uh, what I also selected uh, uh, for today was another very important poem uh, titled Snapshots of a Daughter in Law. And uh, here, uh, I think the very title throws up two very important uh, points to us. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Snapshots of a Daughter in Law is the title of a book also. So, in this particular uh, poem, what is happening is it has got these 10 short. Uh, poems packed in one. Uh, I think the term snapshots first of all tells us that you know uh, that it is almost like one is looking through the lens of a camera mm -hmm. but uh, you know nobody is striking a pose. Mm -hmm. So, it is like people are being caught unaware and uh, you know the, the lens is moving and showing us different images. So, that uh, uh, kind of allows us a certain flexibility to look at these different sections uh, at times as connected, but at times as not necessarily connected. These are different photographs in a sense. Mm -hmm. But these photographs are of a daughter-in-law. So, is this daughter-in-law different from a daughter or is the daughter-in-law a term for all women, not necessitated only by marriage or is it women only within marriage? So, I think a lot of questions because we see, uh, you know, women in different images here in this particular poem. I have not read uh, many poems about the daughter-in-law. It is always about the <laughs> daughter, mother, beloved, wife, but, but, but very rarely about a daughter-in-law. A daughter-in-law. And, mm. and so, the question is that who is this daughter-in-law? Is this mm. a term for mm. all girls because the eventuality uh, for all women is supposed to be marriage, the idea that, you know, eventually they have to get into this institution. So, is she writing from that context or is she making a distinction? So, these are some of the questions that uh, one will uh, probably confront in reading this. So, um, I am all ears, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Hmm. So, uh, you know, you want, it begins like this, you once a bell in Shiverport with henna colored hair, skin like a peach bud, still have your dresses copied from that time and play a Chopin prelude called by Kortot, delicious recollections float like perfume through the memory. So, here is a woman with henna colored hair which means that this woman is an older woman and uh, she still has very good skin. So, she is not really an old woman but she is she's a woman uh, you know uh, who could probably be in her 30s maybe or so on. You still have your dresses copied from that time. What is that time? The time is probably the time before she was married. And delicious recollections float like perfume through the memory. So, recollections of a time gone by. Uh, to quote from the poem, your mind now mouldering like wedding cake. So, wedding cake which is supposed to be delicious and supposed to be uh, almost like, you know, emblematic of the wedding, uh, Adrian Rich writes, your mind now mouldering like wedding cake, heavy with useless experience, rich with suspicion, rumour, fantasy, crumbling to pieces under the knife edge of mere fact in the prime of your life. What are these negative words doing in this, uh, in these three, four lines that you quoted? <laughs> so, so uh, you know, here, uh, I think the, the uh, phrase mouldering like wedding cake, yes. I mean, and uh, mouldering to my mind also brings in, you know, something that's gone stale, mm. not just mouldering yes. as mouldering, but mm. I mean, it's a different word, mm -hmm. but you know, I mean, there's a play here. Mm -hmm and heavy with useless experience. Useless. So, useless. Sweater, you know. <laughs> and the experience that the woman is gaining here is the experience of marriage, of housework and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. So, that experience is useless and you know there is suspicion and rumour and fantasy. And what is happening to the woman, like the cake, she is probably crumbling to pieces under the knife edge of mere fact and this too when she is in the prime of her life. Nervy, glowering, your daughter wipes the teaspoons, grows another way. So, here we do not see the woman as uh, you know kind of uh, 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 being uh, uh, what shall I say very loving. She is not taking to motherhood 
in a very loving manner but the daughter and here it's interesting that it's not a son but it's a daughter the daughter is wiping the teaspoons and she's growing her own way which suggests that this idea of marriage and motherhood is very alienating for this woman so where where and, the and, and it's not necessary that the daughter will, will will take all the examples from her in the positive sense yes she'll go her own way she's going her own way yes so the daughter is also the next generation in a mm. sense so mm. she's uh, you know not particularly she might be wiping the teaspoons but mm. she's also growing another way mm. so here uh, you know the woman who is in the prime of her life who has a young girl she's she's probably wasting her time and this is what brings us to the second part which says banging the coffee pot into the sink so look at the images all these are images from the day to day life of a woman and all these are part of her poetry and the woman is irritated she is annoyed she's irritated. She, she's irritated she's banging she's banging it hmm. she bang so banging the coffee pot into the sink hmm. she hears the angels chiding hmm. and looks out past the raked gardens to the sloppy sky hmm. only a week since they said have no patience hmm. so uh, generally women are always uh, kind of brought up with this one line have patience hmm. so here is a woman who's married she's very irritated with the housework that she's doing and she's banging the coffee pot into the sink and she hears voices in her head and, and uh, the the sky above also appears sloppy to her the sky <laughs> appears sloppy to her and hmm. these voices in her head hmm. the angels hmm. they chide her hmm. and they tell her have no patience hmm. which means that this idea that there is the, the what she has learned has to be you know unlearned mm. and uh, you know uh, be to be uh, totally done away with mm. so have patience changes to have no patience mm. and these are angels who are chiding her so mm. in a sense of course these are voices in her head mm. the next time it was be insatiable then save yourself others you cannot save sometimes she lets the tap stream scald her arm so and so the next time they tell her be insatiable don't be satisfied with what you already have so again this is the second statement uh, we can see how very very I, i mean it applies actually frankly speaking world over in that sense mm. so statements that women are brought up with have patience be satisfied with what you have and you know save others uh, always uh, uh, give up on your comfort and save others this is something that women are always taught so adrian rich has reversed the entire thing hmm. first it is have no patience second be insatiable and the third is save yourself so often you know uh, the, the, when somebody says preserve yourself so save yourself others you cannot save and sometimes she, and so we get back to an image from the kitchen she lets the tap stream scald her arm and a match burn to her thumbnail uh or held her hand above the kettle uh, kettle's snout so again uh, these uh, images tell us that the woman is also engrossed in her own thoughts because you know there's a uh, her thumbnail is burnt by a match her uh, uh, her hand uh, is above the kettle's snout and uh, her so body you know is there her mind is not her there her mind is not there hmm. and uh, you know she is engrossed in all these activities mm. Mm. but she doesn't belong there mm. she feels totally uh, you know at a, uh, at variance at odds with the work that she is doing which means that there is a part of her that wants to kind of come out and express itself mm. so uh, they are probably angels since nothing hurts her anymore except each morning's grit blowing into her eyes so on the one hand it's it's all these you know the match burn uh, you know her hand when it's on the kettle snout uh, and uh, you know it's letting out steam and her hand is probably getting burnt all these things are like angels for her because they tell her you know it's like they give her a nudge they give her a push they remind her that she should not be happy with the kind of life that she's leading this idea of giving up herself to accommodate everybody else is something that takes away a lot from her in fact i see a lot of violence in in, in the you know specific thing that she has mentioned 
you know, the, the cattle and snout and yes. burning finger or thumbnail, etc. All these are violent images. Yes. The fire is not a very pleasant thing yes. to, to happen to a woman. And uh, she, uh, and her mind not being there, uh, she is, I think, in true danger of being destroyed by the world she lives in. At the same time, Adrian Rich uh, says over here that uh, all this is okay. These are almost like wake-up calls for her. Mm -hmm. You know, they mm -hmm. kind of pull her back to reality, but also tell her that, you know, she needs to kind of reorganize her life on mm -hmm. different lines. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, the poem tells us that uh, 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 nothing hurts her anymore except mm -hmm. each morning's grit mm -hmm. blowing into her eyes. Mm -hmm. So every day is a toil for the woman mm -hmm. and uh, it's a never-ending toil, you know, I it think uh, the women in India, particularly in small towns, in big town cities, in metropolitan centers, they are straight away aligned with this kind of a poem. Yes. Even though it's not, it's not America, it's not Europe. So, I mean, we in literature we talk about uh, Sisyphus rolling up the rock. I think it's mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. like every woman's toil on a daily mm -hmm. basis. It's mm -hmm. it's the Sisyphean reality of uh, mm -hmm. uh, their lives. Mm -hmm. So uh, this this is something that she is attacking, and uh, all this is uh, you know from the 1950s. So not the early 1950s, but the idea here is that Adrian Rich understands that. Now poetry, literature has to address the real life of women mm -hmm. and it can't be, uh, you know, outside of that. So I'll uh, share another stanza from this poem, which is the next one, which goes like this, that a thinking woman sleeps with monsters. The beak that grips her, mm -hmm. she becomes, and nature that sprung lidded, still commodious, steamer trunk of tempora and moors, gets stuffed with it all. The mildewed orange flowers, the female pills, the terrible breasts of Budesia beneath that, beneath flat foxes, heads and orchids. Mm -hmm. So, I think the, the first line itself, uh, you know, one can probably discuss it endlessly, that a thinking woman sleeps with monsters. Mm -hmm. Please say something about the thinking woman, because you are a poet yourself. So, so I think you would be able to explain this phase, uh, particular phrase uh, for, for our benefit. So, uh, th this line really appeals to me and mm -hmm. uh, to my mind. The thinking woman is mm -hmm. the, the, the monsters are the thoughts in her head mm -hmm. because the world is telling her a different story. The mm -hmm. world is giving her a different narrative. Mm -hmm. The world is constantly telling her that she has to be satisfied with her life. She has to be, you know, selflessly uh, doing things for other people and uh, she has to be patient. But it's the monsters in her head. So, they are angels and then they are <laughs> monsters. So, you know, mm -hmm. these monsters keep nudging her, they remind her mm -hmm. that, well, she needs to kind of wake up and reject and unlearn all that she has been taught so far. Mm -hmm. So, the beak that grips her, she becomes and nature. So, uh, here uh, there is a lot about nature also that uh, kind of comes in and uh, we often say that, uh, you know, women are the pillars of patriarchy because, you know, they are uh, brought up with these ideas and so they uh, constantly perpetuate it. But here, Adrian Rich's poetry actually, uh, you know, kind of attacks this and uh, says that, you know, everything sh should be unlearned and, you know, women need to redesign their lives and rethink. And here, the woman is a thinking woman. She is no ordinary woman. And uh, nature here, this association with nature takes on various forms here. And um, so if we, you know, in this very uh, stanza, uh, two handsome women gripped in argument, each proud, acute, you know, how one woman is pitted against the other. So she's, it's like, you know, really understanding and, you know, they've been compared to the furies. So the argument ad feminum, all the old knives, she says, that have rusted in my back, I drive them in yours. So the women are pitted against each other. That's, that's the other aspect of this particular poem. So, uh, in a sense, you know, right from using images from the kitchen or from day-to-day -day lives of women to understanding how they are kind of stereotyped and how their lives are stereotyped to moving towards, uh, an un, uh, you know, uh, 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 focusing on the way in which women are pitted against each other. I think Adrian Rich has a lot to offer in this 10-part poem. So, uh, 
I, I was just a, <clears throat> I'm just making a small query. Uh, why is she using two handsome women, not beautiful women, not, not women with, you know, look, looking like flowers and very attractive and smart and all those things. She is picking up her adjectives very, very carefully. So, uh, so actually, you know, at times, uh, she's, as I said, nature appears in different forms in her poetry. Mm -hmm. the, the male, you know, uh, kind of prejudice uh, uh, against women, uh, they are handsome and they are beautiful. But here she's saying handsome, which means the women have become equal and they would like to use their minds as, as much as uh, men would use their minds, organize the world. So they are supposed now not to organize the family, but to organize the world. Yes. And uh, at the same time, you know, like these lines that uh, all that they have rusted in my back, I drive in yours. And when you separate these phrases, then a, the counter narrative also, you know, emerges uh, from, from your discussion. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, this will give uh, an alternative vision uh, to, to readers, both men and women, and it will bring them on equal terms. And then this world got changed. And now, you know, all the uh, phrases will be mixed up and, 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 and they will take over the, the, the consciousness of uh, the individual uh, citizen, whether man or woman. In fact, uh, you know, she also brings in uh, a very important poet in this very poem. Mm -hmm. She brings in Emily Dickinson and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, her very famous poem, My Life Had Stood a Loaded Gun. So, she's uh, just to, uh, you know, uh, read a few lines from the next section, which is section 4. Mm -hmm. Reading while waiting for the iron to heat, writing. So, reading while waiting for the iron to heat, writing. My life had stood a loaded gun mm -hmm. in that Amherst pantry, mm -hmm. while the jellies boil and scum, or more often, iron-eyed and beaked and purposed as a bird dusting everything on the whatnot every day of life. And what a freshest phraseology, you know, it's, it's not yes. usual phraseology. It's not usual phraseology. Mm. The phraseology, okay. I think, in Adrian Rich's poetry mm. uh, is, uh, I think it, it works specially at two levels, of course, there are other levels also, but one at the level of these day-to-day -day images, mm. but the way in which she turns them around mm. and she connects them mm. with, uh, you know, the articulation and expression mm. that women are capable of, I think that kind of... Uh, which is where also, you know, the idea of nature is uh, very, very important. So, um, you know, in uh, one particular section, there is this line, uh, uh, Dulce Rydens, Dulce Loquens, meeting, meaning sweetly laughing, sweetly speaking. Now, very, very, this is a very short one. She shaves her legs until they gleam like petrified mammoth's tusk. So, it shows the Just pressure. See, you see the words. Yes. Mm, selection of it's words. very, very precise. Mm. So on the one hand, there is this pressure on the women to kind of, you know, smile sweetly and laugh sweetly and speak very sweetly. So mm. that's the code that's given to them. Mm. And to shave legs till they are till they gleam mm. like petrified mammoth tusk. <laughs> see the, so the mammoth mm. tusk, but yet petrified. Mm. And generally the mammoth tusk would not be petrified, but mm. here it shows the gleam, but it shows also that this is a pressure Something on that the women. Something will, will not be natural, it, it wouldn't be fresh, it wouldn't be green, it wouldn't have leaves, but it would have a kind of death uh, uh, emerging, you know, uh, from the uh, what you call the petrified stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, important idea, if we were to uh, kind of, you know, extend the ideas expressed in this particular poem, is that, uh, you know, when uh, she uh, writes about... Uh, 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 the long hair dipping, the cheek, the song of silk against her knees and these adjusted in reflections of an eye that sons never saw. So, you know, uh, there, there is a point where she says that did nature, you mm. know, nature seems to be offering everything only to the women, books that, uh, you know, the sons never saw, which also tells us that this idea of the connection between women and nature works at many levels, of course, as, you know, uh, life assuring, enduring, but also something uh, whose onus is only on the women, probably not on the men. So this, this again, uh, you know, throws an important question of the connection between uh, women and nature. So oh, Nature means biology? Nature means uh, the... the, the uh, no, the, the natural. I'll just uh, uh, share this. So uh, she says, pinned down by love for you, the only natural action that within marriage, love, all these are considered to be natural actions for mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, are you edged more keen to prize the secrets of the vault? Has nature shown her household books to you, daughter-in-law, that her sons never saw? So, 
you know, on the one hand that uh, uh, nature uh, is uh, probably addressing only the women and, and you know, the, the, the onus of it all is on them and the men are totally out of it. And yet at the same time, one can also interpret it differently by saying that there is a, a deep connection between the women and nature. But here it is ironic where, uh, you know, she says, has nature shown her household books to you, daughter-in-law, that her sons never saw? Mm. So, you know, the sons don't have this pressure of doing all these things, of having patience, of uh, being kind to others and sacrificing themselves for others. But all these household books are shown only to the daughter-in-law. Mm. So, she is being ironic here. Mm. And uh, there is, of course, uh, you know, that very interesting uh, statement, uh, uh, you know, by um, Samuel Johnson, uh, who had remarked to Charles Boswell that uh, woman preaching is like a dog on its hind legs. It's not done at all, but you're surprised to find it done at all. And she immediately responds to this. So, it, uh, the, the ninth section begins uh, with, not that it is done well, but that it is done at all. Yes, think of the odds or shrug them off forever. The luxury of the precocious child. Uh, time's precious chronic invalid. Would we darlings resign it if we could? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, you know, and she sees, says that time is male and in his cups drinks to the fair. So, uh, I think uh, in snapshots of a daughter-in-law, if you look at it in totality, the, all these ten sections, of course, the, the final section uh, ends on a note of hope. Uh, uh, but uh, it is a life of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of a kind of binding that is there for women and poetry becomes that way of stepping out of that bind, of stepping out of what she calls that kind of solitary confinement and, you know, uh, uh, almost uses, uh, you know, the term tear gas and attrition shelling and so on. So, uh, uh, you know, there, there is, uh, in the final section, there is hope and there is a very strong positive note when she says, well, she is long about her coming who must be more merciless to herself than history. Her mind full to the wind, I see her plunge, breasted and glancing through the currents. And uh, this is how it continues, that, you know, the woman is, you know, finally coming to terms with her life. Again, you know, we connected to the second wave of feminism. Which means that uh, this is where she finally reaches in her poetic journey. She, she, yes. She's going to this conclusion yes. that, you know, women of, of, the, of the modern kind, of, of the uh, new kind, <coughs> uh, would be able to uh, show a kind of mirror to, to, to the male, you know, uh, prejudices uh, that earlier surrounded her, but now she, she is going to fight them, resist them. And uh, this Johnson reference uh, also, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, put me in that kind of, uh, you know, critical attitude that uh, what the 18th century said when uh, women were not around at all in, in terms of yes. social action, uh, but, but they started emerging from Wollstonecraft onwards, the 19th century, and finally we have, after the Second World War, Adrian Rich. Adrian Rich. So and how, how would you conclude? Uh, I would like <laughs> to conclude that firstly, this poem ends on a very positive note, saying that, you know, women are finally, it's been long about her coming, and she's been merciless to herself, you know, who could have been more merciless? Mm -hmm. But, you know, she's finally arrived. And uh, so it ends on a positive note where, like the women who were involved in the second wave of feminism, this becomes a very important point. And uh, it's important to mention that, you know, this particular poem was written somewhere between 1958 and 1960. So which means that, you know, the two poems that we discussed today are poems that cover an entire decade of, uh, you know, uh, Adrian Rich's work and uh, shows us how, you know, there is at the beginning you know, there is a, um, almost like uh, there is brevity, there is precision. And then, you know, towards the end of that decade, she is elaborating these ideas and her uh, poetic journey has become more intense. The craft has become uh, more layered, more complex. So, and she's also brought in Emily Dickinson. And so here, you know, we also have, in a sense, the whole idea of, uh, you know, the the uh, uh, fem the idea of the continuum that she talks about. She's very famous for an essay that she wrote in 1980 called Compulsory Heterosexuality and Lesbian Existence, where she extends the idea of same-sex relations for women to uh, not simply, uh, you know, um, uh, one particular aspect, but she says, uh, you know, a patriarchal motherhood, you know, the institutions by which women have been controlled, she cites them as patriarchal motherhood, 
economic exploitation, the nuclear family, compulsory heterosexuality. She sees a recognition of all this and when women start voicing all these factors and start sharing their stories, that is what she calls the lesbian continuum. So friends, uh, <clears throat> that's a uh, very positive and, and a very assertive kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a conclusion at the end where, you know, women have come forward and they have joined ranks with, with, with men on level of equality. And this is the Indian rich voice uh, that we are supposed to emulate. And uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, you would be compelled to, I'm compelled to rethink uh, my position regarding society. Uh, you know, it, it, it has to be a society where uh, equality should, should reign supreme in the context of uh, men as well as women. So with this particular conclusion, we come to the end of the discussion and I am sure you have a lot to uh, consider uh, in light of what Professor Payal Nagpal has said about Indian uh, uh, specific uh, two or three points. Thank you.